Okay, it's Sarayim Tovim. Good afternoon, Erev Tov in Israel. It's a pleasure to welcome back a Tag Team 2. We're into round three of our four-part series. It's a pleasure to welcome Jennifer Raskis to give her second in this, this series on Truva in Tanakh. And uh, today we're going to be discussing the Yosef story, I believe. Always a fascinating story. And uh, Vakasha, we're looking forward. Okay. Great. So good afternoon or good evening, um, everyone. Uh, thank you again to Rabbi Kalman um, for this opportunity and for the incredible Torah and Torah community that he is giving to the world. Um, thank you so much. And, uh, and a thank you to my chavruta and partner in this uh, series, Dr. Rebecca Winter, who's here with us today. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, so to, to recap, um, Rebecca and I are taking a few weeks to look at some of the stories in Tanakh and think about how these stories can help us focus um, and, you know, and, and complete a chuba process. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at the Yosef stories, which is a story I know that many of us are familiar with, but we're going to be looking at it specifically in terms of what it can teach us in terms of chuva, specifically when it comes to interrelationships, to relationships with others. As always, we are going to start with, um, with looking at part of Rambam's Hilcho Chuba, and we're going to see if the Yosef stories can, can bring some light to, to some of the things that the Rambam puts forth um, to help us in our Chuba process. So does that sound good? Are we all ready? I would like to point out that I wore my Ketonet Pasim shirt, um, my shirt that reminds me of Joseph's multicolored coat for the occasion. Uh, if there's anything around you that brings you color or joy or reminds you of Yosef, feel free to bring that closer to get into the, the Yosef spirit as well. So with that, I am going to share the screen and we can get started. So let's start with the Hilchot Shuva. We're going to look specifically, this is in the Ramam's Mishnah Torah, um, at Dalid Bet. Now, this is the second Mishnah in the fourth parak, and Rambam opens the fourth parak talking about 24 different times when tshuva is not enough to bring a full repentance um, to the sinner. So the first in Aleph, in four Aleph, or Dalid Aleph 4.1, he talks about maybe it's about the sin itself. Maybe the sin itself is so big or so bad that it, may, it stalls the chuba process, what you actually did. And then in our Mishnah, he's going to talk about more the person. Is there something about a person that prevents the person himself from actually succeeding when he is doing the own chuba process? And what I want to do is Ram, the Rambam gives five different types of people who may basically become a stumbling block to themselves in achieving chuba, I want to look at the first one he gave and the last one he gave. So the first example of a person and the last example of a person and see if we can put those two together and learn something deeper from putting them together. So let's start. So the Rambam starts. So here are the five things out of the 24 that we just mentioned, the Elohim, and they are the first one is haporesh min hatzibor, someone who takes himself out of the community. Now for the Rambam, taking yourself out of the community, taking yourself, especially if it's away from all of Israel, is really, really bad. Actually, in, Mish, in, um, in Hilchot Shuvah 311, he says it's so bad that that person, even if he's doing mitzvot, but he's doing it away from the rest of the community, he may not get olam haba. He may not actually have a portion in the world to come. So to the Rambam, taking yourself out of the community is not a good thing at all. Let's look at the next one, which is actually the fifth one. So if someone who takes himself out of the community may act as a stumbling block for himself to acquire chuba, and the Rambam actually goes ahead and says, well, if he took himself out of the community, maybe the whole community was bad and they all did tshuva and he wasn't there for it, so he doesn't get the tshuva. Another person who may act as a stumbling block to himself is someone who can't accept criticism. Why? 
Shehatochacha, we're in the yellow. Shehatochacha go remet lit chuva. Because tochacha, criticism, can actually help someone achieve chuva. Shebizman shemodi'in lo la'adam chatav umachlimin oto chozer b'tshuva. When someone realizes that their sins are actually known to others, there's someone else out there who knows about it, right? Because if you're criticizing it, it means you know about it. If someone else is out there knowing about it, you, it might bring shame onto you, and then you might do something to change it. So either you didn't think your action was so bad in the first place, or you know it was bad, but that wasn't motivation enough for you to stop. But once someone knows about it, that might convince you that it's time to do tshuva. And as the Rambam says, that's actually what a lot of the Nevi'im, what their roles were, was to tell B'nai Israel that they know they can see what B'nai Israel are doing. It's not good. And that that itself led to tshuva. And here's the part where I want us to focus on. L'fichach, therefore, sarich lahamid b'kol kal v'kal Israel. Every community in Israel needs chacham, someone who has wisdom, chacham gadol, a lot of wisdom, v'zakein, and they are mature, v'yeresh amayim anurav, and they've always been God-fearing. And here's the key part, v'ahu lahem, someone who is beloved to the community. That person, shiyem ochiach l'rabim umachsvim b'tshuva, that person is the one who should offer the criticism to the rest of the community, and through that offering, the community will do tshuva. Now, the juxtaposition that I want to bring in is that haporesh min hatzibor is someone who separated himself from the community, is someone who is an obstacle to tshuva, whereas someone who is beloved to the community is someone who can actually save a community, even ones that don't like criticism, they may actually be able to save the community by offering the criticism the community needs to achieve tshuva. So here's my question. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. My question is, why can't someone who's poresh min hatzibor be the one that offers the criticism, right? Let's think for a second, why might it be a good thing? Let's remember the poresh min hatzibor, the reason he doesn't get tshuva is because the community, when they do do tshuva, he's not there for it which actually tells us that he, the Porish Minat Sibor, was potentially part of a community that was bad. So what's so bad? If your community is doing bad things, you're, you, they're not good, what's so bad about separating yourself from the community and then offering the criticism then? What's a positive about hearing criticism from someone who is outside of your community? You can put it in the chat also. And I see there is something in the chat. Oh, those are the sources. They don't Maybe they have a different perspective. Yeah, totally. Especially because we know that the community itself was already not doing well. So if someone goes outside the community, maybe they learn new things, or maybe there was something already in them that had a different perspective. And then they're able to actually offer something to the community. They may seem more objective, Judith, Judith Schwartz says. Hmm, interesting. Um, so whoever is writing from iPad, I love the point, um, which is that Moshe and Aaron were two different types of leaders. Moshe was always seen as separate from the community and Aaron was always seen as part of the community and Aaron was more beloved. So that's very interesting. So I think that's true. I think that there are certainly times when we can think that it might be helpful to have someone from outside the community, whether they're more objective or they've learned something else, it could be great for them to be the ones to offer criticism. But the Ramam is clearly telling us that if you want people to actually change, to actually do chuba, it's better to have someone from within the community. So now let's think the opposite. Why might people respond better to someone from within their community? Because, oh, sir. No, I'm just going to say they understand. Yeah. 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 I love that. Yes. They understand. So tell me more. What might they understand? 
oh, they understand the problems that are going on within the community. Yeah. And they can try to work with, with that person to deal with what the problems are. Yes, I think that that is very true. And we're going to see that in the Yosef stories that when there's when you're part of the community, there's a level of understanding about the circumstances or the specific individuals. There's an additional level of understanding that can really, really help the way that you then offer criticism because you it you know. So what to say differently, what's what's lacking if you're not part of the community? If you don't have that understanding, what might you think about the community? Okay, and I'm gonna look at, so while we're thinking about that, I'm gonna look at the chat. Oh, great. Oh, I love that. So Alana is saying that there's a familial feeling that we know that the person has an interest in the community changing, right? If you're saying, listen, I know things aren't going well. It's kind of like if there's a boat that's not doing so well, if a guy jumps ship and is on the right and is on the raft and he's trying to tell you what to do, that's one thing. But you know the guy's going to end up getting to shore, whether or not the boat makes it. But if someone's on the boat with you and there's literally a hole and a water's coming out and that person is trying to stuff the towels or whatever it is, you know that that person has as much interest as you do as the boat being saved, as the boat making it to shore. Okay, let's see what else they know the person and the conditions. Yes. Ah, so Naomi, very interesting that you're giving us an example of someone who's outside the community, right? That Yona himself was outside the community, although he did have a lot of trouble understanding, right? Why he was given the job he was, but that is very true. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, person in iPad, if you can tell us your name, I would love to know it because I love your comments. Um, in our days, it's the congregational rabbi who tends, he, the person is saying to make better halacha than a yeshiva rabbi. I, maybe I'll add to better, more directly unique for the people that they are working with, right? Because they know the people better. Um, they know the details, the backstory. They can be more focused. This is all really, really great. Yes. So I think you are, oh, anyone? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I think you're all getting to some to some really important things, which is that when you're within the community, you understand the community better, you know the people, you know the circumstances, and the people themselves can trust you more, right? They trust that you actually have their best interest at heart. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the Yosef story and see if in addition to all these amazing thoughts, if the Yosef story can give us some more insight into the difference between being without or far away from the community and being within. And for our purposes, the community in the story is gonna be the brothers. So we're gonna see how Yosef relates to his brothers when he is outside of them, when he is within them, when he is far from them, when he is close to them. And we're gonna see if maybe some of this can help us understand the Rambam, which then can give us a new insight into a way that we can achieve tshuva when it comes to our interrelationships. Sound good? All right, okay. Back to share screen. <coughs> okay, so let's start our Yosef stories. The Yosef stories start when Yosef is 17. Ela todo Yaakov, so, and I will just um, give you some clues as to what all these colors mean. Besides for looking like the Ketonet Pasim, Yosef's multicolored coat, there is also a logic behind that. If you see the yellow, it's really just to help us get like know the details of the story. These are just things we need to know in order to understand what's happening, who, what, when, where, why. The blue means focus a little bit more because this, these specific themes or maybe even words or ideas I believe are integral for understanding a deeper meaning to the story. And the pink, think of it as like a stop sign. These are the words that are gonna be like the leap words, which is like the leap word. It's like the milama and ha, the words that come up again and again, that are really gonna help us understand some deeper themes in the text. Um, and we, again, we're gonna look at the Yosef story, but through the metaphor of being outside and being inside. So let's begin. Ela Yaakov, 
Yosef ben Shabbat Rishana. Yosef is 17. And what's the first thing we learn about him? Hayavro e etechav batzon. Now, the English translation here says that he tended his flocks et echav, meaning with his brothers. But I think we can also hear something else going on. He was ro'e et echav. He was kind of shepherding his brothers, bitzon, as if they themselves were kind of the sheep. And it goes on, v'hu na'ar et bilha. Here again in the English translation, it says he was a helper. Other Mepharshim point out that he belittled them. He made them feel small. Right, so taken together, Yosef is seeing himself as outside of his brothers, separate from his brothers, and more importantly, as superior to his brothers. And what happens when he sees himself as superior? The next blue, Vayeve Yosef et Dibatam Ra'a el Avihem. Yosef then brings a bad report, bad things about his brothers to his father. So we see already, and this is things that you were pointing out, you don't understand everyone if you are on the outside. You don't understand the people, the conditions. You automatically might see things in a more negative light when you're on the outside. So Yosef sees himself as superior. He brings bad reports to his fathers. And sure enough, the brothers, right? If you want someone to criticize you, it needs to be someone that's beloved, that's from within the community, do the brothers like this, this outsider who thinks he's better than them, who, by the way, is only 17, and he's treating them like sheep? Well, not good. But he snew Oto. They hated him. And here's a stop sign, pink. They couldn't talk to him in peace. And the, both the word deber and the word shalom are going to come up again. And to make matters worse, Joseph starts having dreams. His dreams involve his brothers bowing down to him. That's not going to win him any popularity points. He told his brothers the popular, the, not the popularity points, he told his brothers the dreams. And they hated him even more. And you can see the details if you want to read on your own of one of the dreams. He, everyone is a sheaf. All the sheaves bow down to him. And the yellow. Do you really think you're going to roll over us? Are you going to reign over us? If it's possible, they hated him even more. About his dreams and about the things that he was saying. So again, is Yosef trying to get to know his brothers? Is he asking them any questions? Is he wondering why? I see you doing this thing. It doesn't really make sense to me. Can you explain to me why you might be doing it? No, he is going straight. He's reporting things to his father. He is seeing himself as ruling over them. And his picture of rulership is what? Ah, that everyone bows down to me. This reminds me a lot of the Lion King when little Lion King, little Simba, is thinking about what it's gonna be like to be a king. And all he can think about is how he gets to tell everyone what to do. Similar to the Lion King, Yosef will eventually mature. But so far we're at the little Simba stage. Okay. Now, I believe if we read this part of the story closely, I believe that Yaakov knew exactly what was going on the discord between Yosef and his brothers, and that he actually wanted to fix it. So what happens? Yosef's brothers go out and they're shepherding. And they're in Shrem, eventually Dotan, and Yaakov sends them. And Yaakov sends Yosef to go find them. Vayomer lo, lech na re'e et shalom achacha. Now, literally, go see how your brothers are doing, but we already had the word shalom and we knew it meant the relationship between the brothers, right? So lechna re'e et shloma chacha could be Yaakov saying, Yosef, you're here, they're there. There's a lot of distance between you. Why don't you go meet your brothers and try to find shalom, try to find peace. Bahashiveni davar. Yaakov going back to the two things, right? Our two stop sign words, lo yachlu di brola shalom. Yaakov's telling him, go bring back 
shalom and davar, a davar that instead of being dibatam ra'ah is actually a davar full of peace. And it's possible that Yosef actually understood what Yaakov wanted him to do because Yosef sees a man, which is a really random detail that the Torah is giving us, that there's a person and Yosef asks directions. I mean, if I was recording my life and I had to put down every time I asked someone for directions, it would be a really long book. But the Torah wants us to know that he needed directions at this point. And maybe it's because the Torah wants us to know what words he used. When he said to the, the man what he's doing there, he says, et achai anochi mevakesh. Literally, of course, I'm looking for my brothers, but figuratively, et achai, my brothers is what I'm looking for, or brotherhood is what I am looking for. And unfortunately, even if Yaakov and Yosef had the best of intentions, which we hope they did, what happens? The brothers see him. By your u oto from what? Oops, from what? Me ra chok. They see him from a distance. At that point, the distance that Yosef had put between himself and his brothers, where he was superior and they were below him, was just too vast. When they see him coming they see him from a distance. And when you see someone from a distance, it is way too easy to assume ill intent. Ubaterem yikrav, before he could get close, alehem beat naklu oto lahamito. They decided to kill him. And what words do they use? Ah, hine bala chalamota lazaba. Oh, is, it, is the dreamer person coming, coming to, to come to us? Um, they decide to kill him and they say, we'll just see what happens to his dreams. Of course, we know that his dreams are actually going to come true, but they don't know that at that point, they believe that they could stop them. So I wanna stop the share for a second and check on the chat and ask you, what do you think so far? Does this, um, how does this reading, does it, does it bring anything new to the way that you've seen the Yosef stories before? What are you thinking about the relationship between Yosef and his brothers? Mm. Yes, Joel Mandelbaum is pointing out that Yaakov may have had a role in this. Um, it is a theme throughout Sefer Breshit that there is one parent who loves another one more than the others. Um, and we hope each generation that they'll learn not to do this, but it doesn't quite work. Yes, I do believe that Yaakov did prompt some of this. Um, and I, I still think that it is possible that maybe he realized what was happening and wanted a reunion, but you're right. It's possible also that, um, that he was too involved in prompting it. Interesting. May I ask a question verbally? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So um, back in part one, mm -hmm. um, embrace sheet 37, two to five, for the first time ever, and it's the beginning of page two, mm -hmm. um, for the first time ever as I'm reading this, I'm noticing that it's only the sons of his father's wives, Bilha and Zilpa. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. where are the sons of Leah? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think those, those specific ones were the ones that he was being not our two, right? So I think some of Amr Barshim point out that the sons of Bilhan and Zilpa, their mothers didn't have the same status as Leah and Rachel had with Yaakov. So perhaps he like taunted them because of that and held that against them, right? Which we know is not a very nice thing to do, especially if you're looking for uh, a good brotherhood uh, in your future. Um, but I, it's you're right. They don't mention the Leah sons. It's possible that he is tending the flocks with them. Uh, but he definitely includes them in the dream. And we know he includes them in the dream because he actually tells us the number. Of, there's, you know, this many stars and this many sheaves, and he's definitely including all of them in, uh, in that process. Right. And also, okay. um, Bruvain and Yuda, we know, are involved at the, in the pit, you know, at the part with the pit. So yes. I'm wondering when, where, and when and how they show up. Yeah, good question. I think I think they do hear the dreams uh, because again, Yosef is pretty much uh, including them in the ones that are going to bow down to him. 
Um, so I think they probably show up there. And we definitely know, as you pointed out, that they are in Dotan, um, because as you said, they the two of them end up taking lead roles in the story in terms of communication. Ruben always getting it a little bit wrong, and then Yehuda coming in to, to save it um, at the end. And one thing that we're going to see later on, Yehuda is actually going to be like hero um, for, for how this all gets fixed. We're going to see that soon. Okay, Esther. Um, yeah, isn't Simeon one of the leaders? And he is definitely Leia's son. And he is really, he seems very much one of the leaders. And um, I think everybody else is is listening to him and Reuben at the time. Um, uh, that That's, yeah, I, I don't think they all wanted to see um, Joseph killed, even though he was a brat, a spoiled brat. <laughs> But I think that uh, uh, Simeon or, or Shimon um, was really a, a, a leader in, in, in this in this trial. Yeah. So we we are going to hear Shimon a little bit later. Mm -hmm. We're not going to read it in, inside, but Shimon does get a, a featured role at some point in the story. Um, so yes, he definitely is present at all times. And Ruvain, as the oldest, you know, definitely feels responsibility. There's some of them are. Mm -hmm point out that the reason why Ruvain you know, says that we shouldn't kill Yosef, he uses the word ani, me, a little too much, which makes some of the Mepharshim think that what he's worried about is as the oldest, um, that he's going to be held responsible by mm. his father if anything happens to Yosef. So he goes, oh, but what about me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, he, and, and he does end up taking that role. Um, it's interesting the contrast between how Ruvain is going to react and how Yehuda is going to, to react. Mm -hmm. But yes, Ruvain and Shimon are definitely big parts of, of the story and the, the two oldest. All right, any other questions? Um, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Great comments coming in. Okay, let's go back. Are we ready? for Yosef not to be 17 anymore? We're okay with that? We're not too attached to the 17 year old, right? We're ready for him to learn some things? Okay. All right. So Yosef, as we know, doesn't get killed, but does get sold to the Ishmaelim. Um, and he ends up becoming a slave in Potiphar's house. Now, what we're going to see is that Yosef, throughout the rest of his life, is going to learn some lessons that are going to help him realize how to interact with others and how not to interact with others. So let, let's see what happens. The first thing we're going to see is, as you see the title of part two, is that Yosef himself is going to become the victim of divatam ra'a, of a bad report. So what happens? The story is that Eshet Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, Want, wants Yosef to pay some special attention to her that he does not want to give her. And she ends up lying about the whole situation and getting him into big trouble. So first of all, our word diber or davar, which is a very common word in Tanakh, but when it comes up this many times in a very short amount of time, it is worth paying attention to. What happens? Her husband comes home, but to Daber Elav, Kidvarim Ha'ela, she tells him the following things. Lay more. Ba Elai Ha'evet Ha'ivri, Asher Hivetelanu. This slave, this is this Hebrew slave that you brought upon us, Litzachekbi. He came to, whether it's make fun of me or harass me in some way, he's doing this evil thing to me. Ba'yihi Kaharimi Koli. And when I raise my voice, to tell him to stop, the akra v'yazov bito etzli, he left a piece of his clothing with me by Anasa Chutza. This is my proof that he was here. Otherwise, how would I have this piece of clothing? Clothing comes up a lot of times in, in Breshit, right? It was the, the clothing also that the, the brothers were gonna use to, to make a ruse that, that Yosef died. Yaakov himself put on, you know, put on certain clothing to pretend that he was Esav. Clothing is being used as proof, and here it is being used as proof, as in other places, for a lie, for something that didn't happen. When he heard the words that his wife 
Eshe Potifar was saying, Asher Dibra Elav, Lemor, Kidvarim Ha'ela Asali Avadecha, Becharapo. When he hears all these terrible things, he gets really angry and beats Nehua al Beta Sohar. He throws Joseph in the jail. So this is the first time that we know of that Yosef is now feeling what it's like to be on the opposite side of the Dibatam Ra'ah. We don't know if what he was saying to his father was completely false. Here we know it is completely false. And we also know that while Yosef is in jail, that God is with him. Yosef. The Lord was with Yosef, and he showed him kindness. And he and so he showed him so much kindness that the Sar Beta Sohar, the head of the jail, found favor in him. So let's see if these two things help Yosef become a slightly more mature person who can see a little bit more outside of himself. The two things being, he now knows what it's like to be at the end of the Diva Tamra Astic, and Hashem is very much with him and helping him even when he is literally in, for the second time, a pit. So what happens? So Yosef is in jail and there's two other people in jail. There's the butler and the baker, and they come to him in the morning. And Yosef saw them. Now, if this was anyone else, or almost anyone else, I wouldn't think it's such a big deal that he saw them. But what's Yosef up until now? Who has he really been seeing? Himself, right? It was all about his dreams and his position vis-a-vis -vis his brothers and what, you know, he was very much seeing himself. And now, when we said before, is he asking his brothers questions? Now he does. Vayishal at Sarisei Paro. He asked the, the courtiers of Paro. He asked them, Madua Pnechem Ra'im Hayom. He wants to know what's going on with them. When they tell him that they had a dream and they don't know the interpretation, Yosef not only offers to help them with their dreams by helping interpret them, but he says to them, Hello, the Elohim Pitronim. Act, there is going to be an interpretation, but it's going to come from God. Sipru na li. Tell me your dream, and God, through me, will help you with the interpretation. So Yosef is becoming a little more humble or have a little more humility in a whole bunch of different ways. He's seeing the other people around him, he's asking them questions, and he's acknowledging God's role in this entire process and saying that if he's able to help them, it is only through the grace of God. Okay, I see some stuff in the chat, so I'm gonna take a look. Huh, I see that. Yes, Litzachek, I completely agree. The Litzachek should remind us of the, of the words with Yitzchak, right? Um, the word Litzachek came up a bunch of times, also between Yishmael and Yitzchak, and there's a lot of sensitivity there that Sarah had to the whole thing. So yes, I do believe that, that we are supposed to think back to, to Yitzchak. Um, right, and again, no, that's not necessarily that both of them were untrue, um, answering iPad's question. Okay. Okay, so let's keep going. So, and then we know that Yosef ends up not only helping with this, the butler and the baker's interpretation of dreams, but he's going to end up helping Paro. Bayomar Paro el Yosef, chalom chalamti, I had a dream, upator ein oto, bani shamati alacha, and I heard about you, leimor tishma chalom liftor oti. I heard that you know how to interpret a dream and its meetings, and its meanings. And Yosef, again, literally in the face of royalty, he remains the same type of humility when he says, Vayan Yosef et paro, bil adi Elohim ya'aneh. It is through me that God will give the answer to your dreams. Again, putting himself below God. And he uses the word shalom, right? There was no shalom between the brothers. Yaakov wanted him to find shalom. Now we see that Yosef is doing two things. First of all, when it comes to dreams, he's not only focusing on his dreams, he's focusing on the dreams of others and he's helping others understand their dreams. 
And the second thing is that he's already starting to bring shalom, peace to others. It might not yet be peace to his brothers, but he is now the vehicle through which peace can come. And he's doing it all with recognizing God's role um, in, in this process. And we see that Paro, um, Paro hears him and he says, ah, this is a person who has Ruach Elohim, right? He acknowledges that, that God is there, Hodia Elohim Otcha, God has made known this to you, and there and there is Einavon Vachacham Kamocha, there is no one as wise and great as you. And now I am going to let you be right under me. There is nothing is going to be above you except my own seat of command. And let's just look at this nice little summary. Once Joseph learned to interpret other people's dreams, now his own dreams can come true. What were his own dreams? That people were going to bow down to him, right? Now it's actually going to happen. And now Joseph is ready to reface his brothers, but this time as someone who can see others, who also cares about others, and can see and help others with their dreams. I'm going to stop the share for a second. I also want to point out for those of you who are in the Yaakov class that this is similar in the sense that Yaakov had to do something before he could face Asaph, right? He had to do something internally. He had to face his own fears. Here, Yosef's problem was more how he related to other people, right? He separated himself too much from them. He saw himself as too superior to them. And Yosef had to actually work through being able to see himself in relation to others in a different way before he then could face his brothers. So Yaakov has his thing with the Malach and then he can face Esav. Yosef has his whole process of growth through Paro and through the butler and the baker, the Sarah Mashkim and the Sarah Ophim before he can then face his brothers. I just wanna pause here if anyone has any questions or comments. All right. Hello, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so at the end, we're not really up to it yet, but because the topic I'm assuming is the shuva, mm -hmm. um, at the end, uh, Yosef tells his brothers, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you. Everything was a divine plan for God. But I always learned that when you do teshuva, I don't think it's enough. That part of the process is to change your ways, but you have to admit your sin. And he never admits his wrongdoing about how, you know, how he acted towards the brothers. So is that true teshuva for us? Do we have to actually say this is what we did or, or can we just change our ways? Is that enough? It's, it's a great question. It's, it's really interesting about this story because there's actually teshuva happening on both sides. So on the one hand, Yosef needs to do chuba, which is what we're focusing on, which is he needs to realize how he sees himself in position and relationship to others in order to make amends with his brothers. And, what, and the other side is that the brothers themselves have to do chuba for throwing their brother in a pit and right. lying about it and you know, making their dad miserable for many, many years. And there's actually a lot of mafarshim that focus on that part of Chuba, and then they bring in exactly what you're saying. Um, you, you, know, you need to acknowledge what you did, and in some ways acknowledging what you did is being in the same situation and not doing it again. And a lot of the Mepharshim talk about how when they're not willing to give up in Yemen, that that actually is complete Chuba. I think it's the Abarba now specifically who says that. So that's one. So one answer to your question might be no. I think the answer is no, it's not enough. You do have to say it. I think one way to see it is that maybe we can get a full chuba picture by putting together the way that Yosef does chuba and the way the brothers do chuba, that they both help us understand. The other answer to your question is straight in Rambam's Hilcho Chuba. Rambam starts Hilcho Chuba with you need to do vidui. You need to say what you did wrong. You need to say it orally. It's not enough just to think it, you actually do need to say it. So since we're looking at Ramam Silcho Chuba as our guide, um, I, I would say that you are correct, that in order to do full Chuba, according to the Rambam, you do need to admit it. 
And that may be something that is lacking here. You're right. Yosef never specifically says, I was wrong when I did X, Y, or Z. He just lets his brothers know that he's not going to be mad at them anymore. So I think you are right to point that out. And what we're trying to do Thank is you. looking at sort of more of, the, more of the subtleties in the text and see if there's ways that we can see that even if Yosef didn't say it out loud, there are ways to see that he did grow and change through the process of the ups and downs in his life. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Great, great. But yeah, Rambam would be very happy with your question. He would be very excited that you asked that question and he would and he would say, yes, I started my entire Hilcho Tshuva with exactly that point, that you do, if you do want to do complete Tshuva, you do need to say out loud what you did wrong. And Joel, I think that's a great point about the boar. Yes, the word boar comes up not only with the pit, but also in um, when he's in jail, the word boar comes, comes up. Um, and that's a great way to, to use uh, a linguistic cue to, to put them together. That it's only um, when, you know, at this point when Paro summoned Yosef, that he is effectively rescued from the pit. I think that's a very interesting linguistic parallel. So thank you. All right, any other questions before we see? So remember, Yosef hasn't met his brothers yet. He's done a bunch of growth, and now we need to see what happens when they come together. Okay. All right. All right, okay, let's continue. So now Joseph is ready to meet his brothers. So we know Joseph's dreams are coming true. He is now the person that other people are bowing down to. Um, and specifically true, when the brothers are also part of a famine, they need food because of Joseph's leadership. Egypt has food, but no one else does. Um, and they come down to him. And the, the brothers come and they bow down to him. So what's going to happen? Well, if the whole time we were talking about how one of the biggest problems between the brothers was that there was too much distance between them. A lot of distance that maybe Yaakov put there, maybe Yosef put there, right? So there's a lot of distance there. And so much so that it's possible when Yaakov and Yosef were trying to make things better, by Yeruoto, Merachok, they still saw him at a distance, before he could come closer. So what happens here? We were saying that Yehuda was going to make a, a heroic, heroic uh, visit in our story or a heroic action in our story. When the brothers are talking to each other, it is at this moment that the relationship starts to really become repaired. When what happens? It says, Vayigash elav Yehuda. Yehuda close to Yosef. And it's when Yehuda came close and when he's able to talk to Yosef in more vulnerability and talk about, yes, we have a father. Yes, there's a youngest brother. Also, this is what happened to our other brother. This is how the father reacts to him when Yehuda is able to actually come close and tell him in vulnerability and authenticity what is happening to him. That is when things start to um, start to really heal. And I highlighted here, um, which is a description they're using for Benjamin. And the reason why is for those of you who are in the first year, how does the whole interaction between Yosef, between Yaakov and the Malach start, right? And we said, there was a lot of parallels between the two stories. So here's just a linguistic parallel again between the two stories. Now, by Elav Yehuda, we all know in a relationship, if one person comes close, what do you need the other one to do? For the first person not to back away, you need the other person to come close to. By Yom Yosef El Yosef then turns to the rest of the brothers and he says, Gishuna, come close to me. Gishuna Eli, and by Yikshu they came close. So there's a lot of vayigashing happening. Now 
are coming close. And it is when the brothers come close, when it says, Vayikshu, Vayomer, then Yosef says, Ani Yosef Achechem. And he doesn't say, I am Yosef the ruler, or I am Yosef the dreamer, or I am Yosef now in, in charge, you do what I say. He says, no, Ani Yosef Achechem. Um, and Yosef assures them, which he's going to do a few times, that it is because of what you did by sending me here um, that, that God has given me this position in order to eventually save you. And really interestingly, if we look at where he tells the brothers to live, he tells them to live in Goshen. Let's look back at those, that word. You can't help but see in Goshen, Geshuna. He literally tells them to live in a place that has the words Vayigash in them. We thought that was maybe just a little far-fetched. Why does he tell them to live in, in Goshen? Vahayita karov elai, because I want you to be close to me. I want you to all be very close to me. Then they kissed and they hugged Vacharechen. Now that they have all come closer to each other and that they um, and that Yosef is not holding on top of them, he if he ever wanted to hold something on top of them, it's way more powerful than I had a dream you were going to bow down to me is you're actually bowing down to me and I actually am in control right now. But Yosef does not hold that between them. In fact, when it describes the word davar comes back when it describes how they talk to each other. It's dibru echav ito. They talked basically at the same level. And finally, um, I think it was Joan who maybe mentioned this. Um, at the very end, after Yaakov dies, the, brother, the brothers get all nervous. Maybe, maybe, maybe Yosef actually didn't want, uh, didn't want to, to really rule over us because he knew that uh, it would hurt Yaakov, it would hurt our father to see that. But maybe now that Yaakov has passed away, maybe now he's going to really take things out against us and hold it against us, all the things we did to him. So when the brothers say that to him, you know, we just want to assure you that, you know, our father really did want you to be nice to us even after he died. When Yosef hears this, that they have any assumption or worry that he actually is not really going to act like a brother to them, he cries over these, these words. There's our word again. Um, the brothers do bow down to him again, and he's, Yosef says to them, Al tira'o, please do not be worried, ki hatachat elokim ani, because I am under God. Now Yosef was the one who kept putting himself above others, even when he was 17, right? I'm above my brothers, everyone's bowing down to me. And now when Yosef actually is in charge, when he is the you know second to the king, when people are bowing down to him, how does he see himself? He sees himself not as above everyone, but as hatachat elokimani, but specifically as under Hashem. You thought, you thought that you were doing bad to me, but really God had this great plan and through my being in this position, I have the ability to keep you all alive, right? I have this whole plan where I'm going to make sure that you have food. I will make sure that you have food, that you have sustenance and your children, which also, if we think back to the little Simba, I just can't wait to be king. Yosef originally thought it's going to be so great to be king because everyone's going to bow down to me. That's what being king is about. But when he's actually king, he realizes, or second to the king, he realizes that the purpose of the power is to really make sure that everybody, especially his brothers, have the food that they need in order to survive. And finally, we see that Yedaber al Libam, that after all this, the brother who started by giving Dibatam Ra'ah and all the Dabars that went awry, that he gave, that others gave about him, it all ends with the Deber Ali Bam, which translation um, translates to speaking kindly to them. So thinking back to um, thinking back to what this could mean for the Chuba process, I think it can mean a bunch of things. Um, 
I think that, and I'd love to hear what you think. Um, you want it, one interpretation and then I'd love to hear your ideas. I think one thing it's teaching us is that a lot of times when we look at others, when we, I'll, I'll get to the chat in a second. When we look at others, if we see ourselves as apart from them or as separate from them, it's too easy to then see ourselves as above them. And when we see ourselves as above them, then we automatically interpret their, intera their actions negatively. And we see that in the Rambam. The Rambam says one of the worst things you can do is be poor Shmina Tzibor. Even when the Tzibor is being bad, one of the worst things you can do is to take yourself away from the community, to, which starts by seeing yourself as separate from the community. And then it's only someone who's within the community and who's beloved by the community who can actually help the community get them closer to Chuba. That it's the person who sees them, the person that knows them, that the word I believe that we used in the very beginning was understands them. He understands the people, the conditions, circumstances. It's when someone is from within, when they're closer, that they are much more able to to work with the people and to, to make things better with them. Um, so as we're looking to, to do our own Shuba process, I know I will be trying to think about, you know, in what relationships do I have where I may be too far, where maybe, maybe it can be healed through talking, um, you know, through, through trying to understand more, through asking questions more, you know, what are ways that I can do to, to get closer to other people? And I think as a society, you know, we're in a time where we really get a really good view of people from a distance, right? Social media, especially, is really a way that we see people far away. We see what they post, we see what they write, we can respond, and all the times we're really far apart. Maybe we're using 140 characters. And, you know, in today's day and age, when there's so much polarization and there's so much my camp versus your camp, you know, how much more can be accomplished? if we engage in dialogue, if we engage in asking questions, if we engage in trying to understand the other side better, not to agree on everything, but hopefully just for the purposes of understanding. I'd love to hear any of your comments about the Yosef story, about this idea with Chuba or, or anything else. Um, Sandra, you wanna start? Yeah, so I posted something in the chat. I just wanna go a little further here. Um, Great. I think that there's no question, and, and you pinpointed that, that Yosef goes through a process of tshuva to cer a certain level. But I also believe that there's a lot lacking in his process of tshuva. And I think, you know, the minute he says to his brothers, don't worry, this was Hashem's plan. There is an underlying saying there, which he doesn't say, but it's, it's there. It, it wasn't my fault either. It was Hashem's plan, you know. It's not my fault that I had those dreams and it's not my fault that those dreams were true and it's not my fault that so I think that there is the lack of confession that was was brought up earlier, I think is very telling he doesn't take responsibility for it to a certain extent he repairs the relationship, but it's Hashem's plan. And I think that we in our lives have to be very careful with that because we also do that every now and then. No, well, I didn't mean to do it. It wasn't my fault. It's not my responsibility. It's because it was raining or it's because, you know, we, we find reasons not to take responsibility. And, and I think that we can't just let that go in this story. I think that's a great point. Um, and I think it definitely, it's building on what Joan said before that yes, there are things that we can learn from this story that will help us in our Chuba process. And there are things that we can look at and see that are lacking. So I think you're both pointing out, yes, it would have, he never actually sees his own role, right? He, he, he's able to see others, but he may not have actually been able to see his own role in the process. He never apologizes for, you know, for the things that he did initially. Um, so I think that's, that's a great point. And that's one of the great things about Safer Brashid and all of the Torah is that the Avot, and all the characters are not perfect. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of the Mepharshim dig into, well, how can we understand this in a good light? And then sometimes how do we learn something not so good or what happened in the future that may be because they didn't, you know, do the complete process. So I think, I think that's a, a really, really um, great point. Any other points anyone wanna bring up verbally? 
I see a question in the chat. Can I repeat the connection between Goshen? Um, so what I was saying is that the word Baigash, and especially Gishuna, is very, very much sounds like the word Goshen. So when, when Yosef is telling them to live in Goshen, um, especially because it uses the words, live in Goshen because it's Karovelai, because it's close to me, we can see that as an extension of Yosef trying to keep the, the distance minimal to, to keep the closeness with, with his brothers. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yes, and Joel is pointing out, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at Joel's, Joel is pointing out, I'm gonna um, summarize it, that there is some things that Joseph does as viceroy that is not very admirable. And that is very true, that if we actually look at the text, um, he does kind of make Egypt sort of a welfare state where almost everyone except his brothers have to give up like all rights to their own property and it becomes you know, the king's property. Um, and it's not actually so great for, for Yosef. So I think for the people of Egypt. So I, I agree um, with that. And here again, it's, uh, it's ways that we can, you know, what can we look at the story and learn from? And what can we look at the story that wasn't great and learn from that. You know, there's a lot of negative that happens uh, after Yosef dies. Um, and, you know, how much of that was because of this system that he set up that, that wasn't very positive. Um, so I think it's important to, to look at all aspects of it. Any other questions? I thought that um, they went to Gosh or they were, you know, he, they, he suggested that they go to Goshen because that was um, far away for from the um, Egyptians, and that way that the cultures might not interact as much as they could if they were more, you know, in the middle of the Egyptian culture. Yeah, I think I, I think there's different. Um, there's a few reasons probably why they went to Goshen. One of them, as you say, it's separate. Another one was that um, they made their living off of shepherding and to the Egyptians, the sheep were actually godly. So it would actually be really, um, it would be really hard for the Egyptians or just it would be disgraceful in their eyes for them to see the way that they treated sheep. Um, so for that reason also, Yosef told them to live at Goshen. Um, and I think there's also what to look at in terms of the play of words. Um, I think all of those things, you know, can be true at the same time. Um, so again, not a perfect story. You're all right for pointing out the parts of it that are not perfect. Um, yet what can this story teach us, especially if we look at it metaphorically in terms of what happens when you're Merachok, Ubatara Mikrav, versus what happens when you're Vayigash? Um, I think that there's a, you know, a lesson here that all of us can learn. Um, I know I myself can learn and hopefully it'll help us be you know, more Vayigash closer to the completion of the chuba process as we ourselves get closer to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So wishing you all uh, Shana Tova. Um, the next and last session is gonna be with Dr. Rebecca Winter next Monday, same time, same place. Two weeks, two Mondays. Oh, two Mondays, sorry. Next Monday's there for Shoshana. I think that's uh, not a great that's time. <laughs> not a good time, not a good time. I mean, I it's up... a good time for, for Chuba, but not a good time for a class on Chuba. This is actually, it's, this is like theoretical Chuba, then we got to do practical Chuba. So <laughs> that's also theoretical, whatever, okay. <laughs> Anyways, that yes, thank that you. By the way, you know, in the... Um, in the RCA Art Scroll Sitter, that goes back to like, you know, um, the 80s where, where Saul Berman wrote the introduction. You know, have you seen it? So he talks on Vayigash, the three times that Vayigash is mentioned in Chumash. Um, can take a look. You know, we, you know they, they put out a separate RCA Sitter back in the 80s. Anyway, so just uh, talking to the Vayigash, but that's besides by Yosef. But anyway, if anybody wants to take a look, I don't remember the whole article, but... Uh, he goes through the different uh, articles. That's his introduction to the whole notion of the sitter, but you got that we're approaching God when we daven. Anyways, thank you very much. Shana uh, Tova, Tiva Tova, and uh, all the best, and uh, hope things are well in the capital of our southern neighbors, and uh, whatever. It's, uh, we should have a, a good year for all of us, a healthy year, safe, uh, healthy, and uh, 
you know, a, a more normal year the way it used to be a couple of years ago. Anyways, okay, um, eight thirty tonight. Mark Shapiro on Sha well, Lieberman or Show Lieberman tomorrow morning. Uh, Rav Aaron Adler. I went through this at last class. So it's all uh, on the website tomorrow morning. Rav Aaron Adler on Rav Soloveitchik on Rosh Hashanah. Um, the, the the two Yomadins. We experience Rav Soloveitchik talking tomorrow to two Yomadins. On Wednesday, Benny Gazzone is talking to Nathana Tokev, and then we have our special Shear 115 on with Rabbi Alex Israel on the shofar, what's still listening to on, on, on the shofar. I sent out that last yesterday to register, and uh, the rest is Shearm during the week. Okay, everybody have a wonderful day. We hope to learn with you soon, and invite a friend, and uh, and have us join, and uh, be well, everybody. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all.